What a joy that you have found us for this podcast. How exciting it is to think that this spiritual message is going out to people around this planet. Whether your life is working at a peak level or whether it can use some enhancement, have I got the message for you today. So get a piece of paper, get ready to take notes, call a friend, have them watch this podcast also. Then you too can have something to talk about and take it to a deeper level. So enjoy. Here we go. Good morning, Seaside. Wow, what a joy it is to be with you on this fabulous summer day. The sun is out, the waves are up. It is good here. And we are about to begin an enchanted journey. The practitioners have been asking, hey, we want another sacred circle, a sacred circle. And those of you who don't know, sacred circles are a, a home study group where you take the Sunday message to a diff- deeper level, facilitated by one of our religious science practitioners. And so, <clears throat> We're going to do one in the fall, but you know what? We came up with one for the summertime, and it's called The Enchanted Journey. It's the first one I ever wrote along with Reverend Alice Bandy. And I'd like to share with you a quote from Ernest Holmes, who's the founder of Religious Science, that we use to start off The Enchanted Journey. Ernest wrote that the physical body is evolved for the purpose of allowing consciousness to function on this plane. The body is necessary to this plane since only through a physical body can we properly function here. And when the body is no longer a fit instrument, the soul deserts it and continues on to function on another plane. So what we're talking about here with this journey is that soul, is that spirit, is that something that animates this bag of bones, that liveness of who you are, has entered into this world for a journey that is enchanted, that is magical, that is wonderful, that has before it all sorts of possibilities that are just waiting for you to say yes to experience the wonder and the truth of who you are. Life is saying, come on, it's yours, it's yours, but you get to step into it. And that choice really comes down to you. And I, and I learned a lot about that from watching my brother get ready to go out on Friday nights. He would just get all gussied up in front of the mirror. He would take a long time getting that male body of his looking right, smelling right. And he'd throw on the clone and he'd say, oh man, it's going to be such a great night. And I said, what are you doing? I don't know. He didn't know where he was going. <laughs> But he had such an attitude that it was going to be a great night and great things were going to happen. You know what? He had a great night and great things were going to happen. And so it just clarifies one more time. You know, it's the attitude we bring into this world. Um, you know, because the journey's not done. I mean, for humanity or for you as an individual. Kabir, the, the uh, Indian uh, mystic poet, he wrote that... Can you tell me who built this house, meaning this body? Can you tell me who built this house and why are you rushing so fast before death? Can you not find the thing of true value here in this world? What's the rush for? What are you rushing for? To get to death for what? Can you not find what you're looking for here? And see, that's the journey we're on. We are on this enchanted journey that has all sorts of wonderful, magical, mystical possibilities that's just calling for us. And life is enticing. You say, come on, take a look. Come on, have that expectation. You can do it. Listen to that that inkling, that hint that you have. You know, the Zen Buddhists have something called following the footprints of the sacred ox. They have these stories of following the, the, the sacred ox. To them, it is a sacred expression. And the footprints they follow in, in, into, the, into the forest, into the unknown, into the enchantment. And Joseph Campbell, he talked about that, seeing the footprints for the first time as the awakening, as the inner call to that inner kingdom that call to that sense of enchantment, being able to move to a place where you come to discover that truth of who you are, the magnificent, to enter into that enchanted journey without fear, but with a sense of, show me, God. I'm ready. I am ready to know what is there that I'm looking for. Don't know what it is, but I've got this expectation that it is good, but in the goodness comes the pain, and a lot of times those first footprints of that uh, sacred ox are, are the pain that we have. They can be the call. Any of us can have our own, it, that leads us to a question. That question can come to us through our, our pain, through our joys, through our relationships, through our challenges. This world is there where the creation and the destruction, it is all part of it. It's not, one is not good, one is not bad, it is all God. Uh, uh, one of the great uh, Hindu sages of the last century, Ramakrishna, who was just renowned throughout India for his visions, 
told the story of sitting down on the Ganges and saying that he was going to stay there at the riverbanks until he actually saw the face of the Divine Mother. That he was not going to move until he saw the face of the Divine Mother. That, that essence of creation. And he stayed there for days and days in Samadhi, in prayer, you know, visualizing, calling forth. And one day he began to see the ripples on the top of the Ganges. And the ripples began to part. And up out of the water came this magnificent, gorgeous goddess long flowing hair flowing with the river itself the eyes were just deep where all of creation could be seen and as he looked in awe this beautiful expression of creation the divine mother what poured forth from her was the creation of babies of children of animals all of the creation of nature poured forth and he watched in awe until it turned to terror where she bent over and picked up one of the little babies and ate it and it got very graphic after that i won't share that part (laughs) But what he got was right there that she was the creation. She was the continuation. She was the destruction. The goddess, the Hindus have Kali, the goddess of of creation and destruction, that the same essence, the same life force is in the beginning, it is in the continuation, and it is in the end. It is there at the start, the middle, and the end. It is all that life and what may look like pain, whether it's the pain of birth, the pain of death, the pain of doing this life, or the joy of doing this life. It is all that creative essence where there are many different kind of metaphors attempting to explain it. But there is that sameness. And as we enter into this enchanted journey, we will become to discover that life force that is showing up with many different faces, whether it is our difficulties and challenges and issues and dramas in life, or the joy and the elation and the exaltation. It is the same essence that is taking the form. And it's happening in the now moment. Now. You know, try to figure out the past. It's not in the past, not in the future. You know, Trevor, as I share with you, his favorite TV show is Wheel of Fortune. It doesn't do any, that comes on at 7. It doesn't do any good for him to want to watch Wheel of Fortune at 8 o'clock at night. It's past. It's gone. It doesn't do him any good to want to watch Wheel of Fortune at 6 o'clock. It's not on until 7 o'clock. And in our life, it, you know, we can get caught up in the past and we can get caught up in the future. But you know what? The only place that the creation and the enchantment and the real journey is, is in the present moment. The present moment is the only place where eternity meets and intersects with linear time. And so we can get caught up wishing that someday, futurizing, Or we can get caught up saying, I wish I could change the past. The miracles and the enchantment can only take place in the present moment. And when we're willing to step out there in the present moment and begin to claim the magnificence of who I am on this life path, knowing that life has something for me to understand, to get to, to experience, to bring forth the greater aspect of who I am that is residing in this house at this time, I begin to call forth that something. But I follow. I follow the call. I follow the footprints of that sacred ox. I follow that something into the forest where the enchantment is. I have to be willing to step out. Get ready. Get ready for that Friday night. I get ready to receive it. I don't know what it is, but there's something that is calling. That's the enchantment you don't know. You can only experience the enchantment of the journey by going on the journey. You can't have it all figured out in advance. This is my itinerary. This is my uh, AAA trip tick that's showing me where I'm going. We've got to begin to look, to look, to look, and to call forth that what's in store for me is not based upon my past experiences. I'm not going to perpetuate the pains and the difficulties. You know, I've been struggling to just have enough dollars beyond your bills, and you're saying, I am broke. That may be a description of your material experience here, but you know what? As soon as you say it, you put it into the next moment. You put it into the the future. What you can begin to say is, I am an infinite expression of the abundance of life. I am living in a rich universe. The finances flow through me with ease and grace, and as I begin to put that kind of consciousness out there, that creative uh, aspect of my being takes hold, and as I say that, I stand up straighter. I feel better about myself and I begin to attract into my experience that but if I'm harboring those things from the past like uh, I've been rejected a couple times in relationship and so all of a sudden say I always get rejected in relationships no the fact is that 
I got rejected a couple times. That's the material fact. And the fact is there's probably a slew of people that are ready to overcharge their charge cards to take you out. (laughs) And so you begin to say, rather, I'm not very attractive or I get rejected, begin to say, you know, I am attracting wonderful people into my world because I am wonderful. And the truth of that is what you begin to do is attract wonderful people who recognize the wonderfulness of who you are. You've got to know that you are wonderful and that you are attractive because if you're sitting there and saying, hey, people reject me and I am no good, you know, the vibe you're putting out is not, hey, I'm hot stuff, come get me. (laughs) You've got to prepare yourself. You've got to be willing to go towards that sense of enchantment. You've got to be willing to step off into the unknown. You've got to be willing to move a little bit farther down the road with that sense and that attitude that the enchantment that is waiting for you can be filled with the happiness and the joy and the wonder of God, the divine mother, the divine creation. That is everywhere, that is everything that is showing up in different things. And I'm going to start this day, Carol King, sorry, I'm not a music guy, but I'm going to start every day with a smile on my face and, um, help me, a song in my heart, (laughs) or a love in my heart. And Yeah, and love in my heart. I'm going to start every day with a smile on my face and love in my heart. That's the attitude I'm going to put out there because if that is not the attitude, then what you're going to get is the junk that is left over from everybody else. There's a lot of junk out there. You get that because no one else wants it. And if you're not claiming you're good, you get the leftovers. And it is amazing the things that we attract into our life. It is just mind-boggling what we begin to integrate into the experience of what took place. You got rejected a couple times, all it means you got rejected a couple times. But all of a sudden you say this about what happened. You know, there's a great story um, that was sent to me, and it says an actual Associated Press headline. So I, I, this could, I think this is a true story, but it came on the internet, so I never know for sure, okay? But, but it's a good one. Killer biscuits wanted for attempted murder. So it caught my attention. It said, Lisa Burnett, 23, a resident of San Diego, was visiting her in-laws, and while there, went to a nearby supermarket to pick up some groceries. Several people noticed her sitting in her car with the windows rolled up and with her eyes closed and with both hands behind the back of her head. One of the customers, who had been at the store for a while, became concerned and walked over to the car. He noticed that Lisa's eyes were now open, and she looked very strange. He asked her if she was okay, and Lisa replied that she had been shot in the back of the head and had been holding her brains in for over an hour. The man called the paramedics, who broke into the car because the door was locked, and Lisa refused to remove her hands from her head. When they finally got in, they found that Lisa had a wad of bread dough on the back of her head. A Pillsbury biscuit canister had exploded from the heat, <laughs> making a loud noise that sounded like a gun, and the wad of dough hit her in the back of the head. And when she reached back there to find out what it was, she felt the dough thought it was her brains. <laughs> and she initially passed out, but quickly recovered and tried to hold her brains in for over an hour until someone noticed to come to her aid. <laughs> I just, what a visual. This cracks me up. <laughs> Got some material facts. We add our uh, scenario to it, and it is real to us. We are on this enchanted journey of creation, destruction, and we got this body, this house that was built for our spirit and our awareness, our consciousness to journey through this world. We have entered into this world. We have entered into the enchanted forest. We have entered into the time of enchantment, and you can experience the wizards and the joys, and you can experience the terrors and the traumas, but what you can come to recognize if you pay attention is that things begin to respond to you. It's what I've been talking about this morning. It is what the scientific community is pointing out. As you know, I've been reading this book called The Divine Matrix by Greg Braden fascinating book, Um, and I wanted to read a piece to you since I'm not quite as brilliant as he is in trying to uh, share it with you, but it, here it is. It's how we're all really connected in science. Modern science is hot on the trail of solving one of the greatest mysteries of all times. You may not hear about it during the evening news, or you probably won't see it on the front page of USA Today or the Wall Street Journal, yet nearly 70 years of research in the area of science known as new Physics 
is pointing to a conclusion that cannot be escaped. Everything in our world is connected to everything else. The fact that discoveries show that we can use our connection consciously opens the door to nothing less than our opportunity to tap the same power that drives the entire universe. Through the oneness that lives inside of you, me, and all humans who walk on this planet, we have a direct line to the same force that creates everything from atoms and stars to the DNA of life. But there's one small catch, however. Our power to do so is dormant until we awaken it. The key to awakening such an awesome power is to make a small shift in the way we see ourselves in the world. Science is showing how everything is all connected. Science is beginning to show how that stuff between me and you, that, 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 that ethers, that space it, it is not empty. It, all that stuff is uh, of the electrons and the protons and, and the photons. And what science is beginning to document, and this is mind-boggling to me, that uh, the light particles, the, the stuff in between this is, it, is waves and particles, and the light particles or the photons, what it is doing through experimentation is showing how it is able to bilocate, how a light particle can be in one place and miles somewhere else at the same moment in time and space. I mean, this is, this is science fiction stuff that is being repeated over and over and over, how there is information that, and, and data in one place, and before it is sent, it is appearing somewhere else. I mean, this is the future scripts of Star Trek, you know, Star Wars. Science is creating these repeatable experimentations that shows how information quantumly appears someone else, somewhere else at the same time or even before it sends. It is transcending what Einstein talked about. The fastest thing was the speed of light. It is moving faster than the speed of light. Einstein was the one who was saying that the time of past, present, and future are intertwined, and the actuality is that the concept of past, present, and future is a stubborn, persistent illusion. So I come back to it's all in this present moment. The present is where time intersects eternity. That the creation and the destruction is all possible in one place. This idea isn't science, you know, is, is proving it. So us Western folks are saying, oh yeah, you know, maybe there is some validity to it, but you know, the, the Hopi nation or even other Native Americans believed that in the beginning there was this void and grandmother spider before anything else cast her web so it would all be connected. Um, the Buddhists have the god Indra and you talk about Indra's net. I don't know if you ever heard about that, but in the void, Indra cast her net, the net to infinity in all directions so there would be a connectedness. The Greeks talked about this concept of ether that I mentioned a moment ago. Ether is that, that invisible substance that connects things in a unified field. That was before the Einstein unified field. The Greeks were talking about that. Pythagoras, uh, uh, as well as Aristotle, talked about the ether being the fifth element, where we have earth, wind, fire, and water. They talked about the the elusive fifth element of ether. So Isaac Newton, the father of modern science, talked about the ether that connected it all. Ernest Holmes in his book, The Science of Mountain, talked about ether. There is this something that they're saying is the light, particles, and waves. It is there. It is what connects us. It is all possible. It is all instantaneous. And what is essential to get that resonance, to get that going, is to claim it. It's going to be a great Friday night. Or I'm going to step into this enchanted journey with excitement knowing that Spirit is about to reveal to me something far greater than I could ever have imagined. And I set that vibration that, that calls forth all that is connected to that resonance. It is that law of attraction that is working. You ever want to be around people that are exciting? It is because they're fun. They create excitement around them. They're a magnet for fun and excitement. Hang around people that are duds. Man, they somehow know how to kill a good buzz. <laughs> the choice is yours. <laughs> I remember being in India. It was just eye-opening. Standing in line in Delhi, in a public post office, a million people, hot day, waiting in line, 
And they'd like these people would go to the front of the line, cut in in front of everybody and get their whatever they're doing, and they'd go. I finally said, what's up? What are those guys doing? And they said, oh, they're of a higher class. I go, what? Higher class? <laughs> they say, yeah, you can do it if you want. <laughs> it's like, and people would let me do that? You know, here, if you want stamps, you don't want to wait, you, get, you hire somebody to do that for you. That's a higher class here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, I also got, as a little kid growing up, I used to all the time go with my dad to movie premieres and screenings. I can remember, you know, like the, the Hollywood Grauman's Chinese, you know, the red carpets and the lights and things were spinning and the photographers. And, or even if you go to the Academy Awards, same thing. You go there and you get out of the car and there's two places you can walk. You can walk with everybody else into the building or you can choose to walk down the red carpet. Nobody says you can't walk down the red carpet, but just about everybody walks in with the main crowd. Well, I'll tell you, I always walk down the red carpet. That was great. You know, yeah, take pictures. Yeah, do whatever you want. But it comes down to the choice that you have. You can choose the red carpet experience, or you can go with the crowd. You can buy into the headlines. But you know what? We're in a time that needs you to claim the magnificent spiritual expression that you are. We're in a time where it's to set up that resonance and that that web of life, that vibration that calls forth a a greater way of being rather than just the traditional one. There was this young guy going to college. His name was Bill. He, uh, you know, holy, you know, T-shirt, wild hair, jeans, no shoes. Basically, that was his attire for four years of college. And um, across the street was a church. Now, Bill was a very smart guy, brilliant, actually. And you know, one day he decided to go to this church, and this church was a very conservative church, a, a very proper, prim kind of church who very much wanted to have a college outreach since they were across the street, and they never quite knew how to do that. Well, one day when Bill walked in through the back door, and he was late, like he was for all of his classes, and he walked in, and he, he didn't see any seats, and so he started walking you know, to the front, you know, coming down the center aisle, looking, and uh, everybody, you know, is sitting there in their suits and their ties and their hats and their hair sprayed perfect and, and you know, very, uh, you know, conservatives, this uh, church. And they just looked at him. And it was like you could hear the gasp. Ooh, ah. And he was looking and he was looking for his... And there wasn't any... So by the time he got to the front row, he, he just, you know, crossed his legs and sat down on the carpet and looked up and, and started listening to the sermon. You know, everybody was just staring at him. And then... And from the back of the room came the deacon. You know, th- this deacon started walking, you know, towards Bill. And this guy, eight, he was well into his 80s. You know, he was the elder of the church. You know, three-piece suit, silver hair, very dignified, walking with his cane. And all that you could hear in the silence was his cane <laughs> as he walked down. And he, even the minister stopped talking. And nobody could blame this deacon for what he was about to do. And as he got closer and got to Bill... You know, he dropped his cane on the floor and everybody just let him do what he was going to do. And, and he went ahead and got down on the ground and sat down next to Bill because he didn't want him to worship alone on his first Sunday in church. So by the time the minister composed himself, he said, guys, you, may, you will probably never remember what I say this morning in my sermon, but you will never forget what you just saw. That's the kind of teaching that we're doing through our experience. Your examples and your expression and your walk and your enchanted journey may be the only Bible or spiritual expression people may get that week, that month, and in your life. You are connected. And you are on an enchanted journey that is wonderful and that is magical. And it is up to you to begin to know it doesn't matter where you are or who you are or what age. You could be 80 years old that we're living in a different time. You know, thousands of years ago, our purpose on earth, basically, I think, was about uh, the procreation of our species and our humanity. Thousands of years ago, we lived 35, 40 years. Our body was no good for the procreation process, and that was about it. We were done. But times have changed. And so when we hit that 35, 40, or 40, you know, we we get to that that, that era, and we... We feel nature is no longer assisting us with our attractiveness. You know, the body's not quite as firm as it used to be or as voluptuous as it once was or, 
or you would not, don't have quite that same radiance. And, um, you know, it's just the, the eggs and the sperm's just not what it was. And you're thinking, body has, what is going on here? Well, we are entering a time in history where it is time for us to birth from consciousness something that is more valuable than babies. And it's time for us to birth from that womb of consciousness the truth, the spirit here in humanity, so we can begin to claim at a new level for the peace upon our planet, the health within our bodies, the abundance for all of humanity, a world where we honor our brothers and sisters no matter where they may be on this planet or where they are in their walk in life. It is time to allow the womb of our being and consciousness to bring forth that new divine mother of creation. It is time for that to happen. And being that we are all connected, it's possible. Science is showing us that as the idea is known here, it can be known everywhere across. This is an enchanted time that we are in. We're getting the documentation. But what happens with the crowd that is choosing not the red carpet, you know, the crowd that has been taught to pray for the things, they've been taught to pray for the health, they've been taught to pray for rent, they've been taught to pray, they have forgotten the truth of being is what we want to pray for is the source of that abundance. What we want to do is to know the source of our wellness and our wholeness. The body knows how to respond. What we want to do is to connect in that divine connection that is available for everyone through the ethers, through the countless time, space, continuum. We want to connect with the source, the abundance, the health, the wealth, the being of ourself, and everything else falls into place. You know, Jesus had talked about praying for loaves and fishes. What we want to do is pray for that which is the source and the creation of the loaves and fishes. You know, what we want to do is get to that place and be that source expressing. He told us in the Sermon on the Mount, you can read it in the sixth chapter of Matthew, where he, he said... You know, do not concern yourself with these things. Do not concern yourself for what it is you will eat or for what it is you will drink or what it is you will put on your body, but seek first the kingdom of God. It's righteousness and everything else is added on. When we choose to take the time and sit down on the banks of the Ganges and just say, I'm going to stay there until I see the face of the Divine Mother, and I will know that it is all things beautiful and ugly. I'm going to stay there and be committed to be a place where that full residence of spirit has its source, and it cannot help but to quantumly show up in other places. That's how much power and value you have in this world at this time and this history, and when you're willing to do that, you will move beyond the bounds of your body. You will move beyond the silence of your mind. You will move beyond the context of your words. You will move into the eternal presence present now where eternity crosses and intersects with this time in which we live it is not a mistake that you're here it's a journey it's an enchanted journey that we've all agreed to at some level to be here together because we're all connected so enjoy your journey So I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward as we do take our gift from our heart. Again, a lot of heart and soul and passion. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I give, and all that I receive. I am prosperous now. Hey, I trust you enjoyed that podcast. It was very exciting to be able to create that and to know that there are people like you all around the world that are observing and integrating these spiritual principles into their life. And so if you enjoyed it, what I'd like to do is encourage you to tell a friend or bring several friends together and watch another one of these podcasts. And then afterwards, take some time to talk about the spiritual principles, to talk about the stories and what significance they have and relevance they have in your life. What then happens is it moves to a deeper and deeper level in your world. It becomes real and assists you to create the freedom in your life that your heart and soul so desire. So if you like this, I encourage you to watch it again, but also tune into our website here at seasidecenter.org. There, 
um, you can get some of my written material and take a look at it. You can read some of my spiritual prayers. You can even go to our online bookstore and order some of the books. And if you're so moved, what I greatly would appreciate is your financial support, which you could do online at seasidecenter.org. It is support like yours that assists us to be able to continue to do these kinds of gifts for humanity and send it out to the world. Because you know what? We are making a difference with this spiritual message. And because of support like yours, people are being touched in the farthest reaches of this planet, as well as our backyard, more than we could ever begin to realize. So I thank you from the fullness of my heart for making a difference.